you have your story they have theirs and another one lies undiscovered between you that's that's mine mm, yeah that's yeah. good that's if i can keep that in mind every time i write or speak that feels that feels true <laughs> This is not another conversation about the problem with wokeness. This is not another conversation about the beauty of free speech and the damages of the culture war. This is a conversation post all of those things. This is a conversation with people who have been in those conversations for years and are going to reflect on how that has affected them, how the discourse around all these cultural issues, all our political disagreements um, has affected us. And I'm really excited that we are here in a makeshift revolution of one studio in London with two of the most amazing, inspiring people that I have looked to for guidance in my own work for a long time, for years, um, Aisha Akambi. You have inspired me for a long ass time. Um, I remember the first time I started speaking more honestly um, online and being willing to be the heretic, being willing to be the one that nobody agrees with, but that I felt I was in my integrity. You inspired me to do that because I saw you doing it and I thought, oh, it can be done. And you are just this ball of light that I don't know how you do it because it shines through a, a screen you know we were just talking that both of us have only been in person twice and this is the second time <laughs> <laughs> and yet we have this this energy this connection between us um and I'm fascinated by what that is because especially in the spaces that we're in where there are so many contentious discussions about really important topics, topics that people care about, whether it's gender, whether it's individual rights, whether it's um, equality or, or just culture in general. These are things that people get really heated about because they're meaningful to our lives. And um, you've been able to navigate that space by helping to show people, and this is my perspective of what mm. you do, by helping to model what it's like to have genuinely productive conversations, how to actually talk about things in a way that keeps you in your integrity, yeah. but doesn't necessarily lead you to just mistreating other people in the service of what you believe. Mm. So you, the people watching this know who you are. <laughs> you know, I want to go deeper. You already have all these amazing interviews where you express your worldview, your philosophy, your ideas on all the cultural issues. And I recommend people look those things up. You were on Coleman Hughes. You did a great podcast recently, or maybe not recently, like, um, about free speech with the Alpine Oh, yes, with the Alpine, like yeah, at the Alpine Festival. Yes, yeah. yes, and that was amazing. I mean, you were very early with your video, the um, something, the problem with wokeness, that mm. one, classic. Like, it's going to be looked at, in my opinion, in the future as a, what happened during yes. this time? <laughs> you were right there. So, I mean, all of that exists. So this conversation, to me, is, I want to get really deep into our experience as people trying to navigate these idea spaces, right? We're, all, we're thinkers. We mm -hmm. think about things and we're uh, speakers. We articulate the things that we're thinking. And that's a really complicated thing to do in general, but it's also really complex to do online and social media, which is a really strange place that has so many um, invisible impacts on us and particularly the way we express ourselves. So... Let's pick up with the conversation that we were just having, Yes, which is, um, I think you were making a great point about how it can, it can have this um, backfiring effect 
expressing yourself online because on the one hand you've got this great free platform to just totally say your your piece and and expose your worldview but at the same time it comes with this reaction right there's this interaction that's always happening between you the medium and the people on the other side of that medium that are that are the audience and um i have found that that's been difficult for me as a writer um my writing was better early social media Mm. the more i've been on social media and in the discourse the harder i found it to be truly free and creative in my writing it feels like i'm always in conversation with what you call in in one of your recent interviews the mob Mm. in your mind i think is what you said it's like i'm always in conversation with these other people that you know a lot of the times my writing isn't for them anyway so if you want to pick up where you left off about your experience with how social media can be so difficult to navigate as a writer and a thinker yeah i you know it's a big question i wonder where i start Mm -hmm. i think for me you know i've been fortunate in the sense that most people have responded to me quite well yeah you know i haven't had a, a tremendous amount of backlash considering a lot of the things that I'm saying aren't, you know, within the bounds of the approved narrative. And I do think that's because of the way that I express it. I really actually do believe that you can say what you like, but you can't say it any way you like. You know, if you want to be heard, or not even heard, listened to. You know, there's maybe a difference between hearing something and and listening, you know. And I was always quite intent on on, on being listened to, you know, uh, with what I was expressing. But even though I didn't have much backlash, there was still something that I always found peculiar and bizarre about being told every day, you know, you're wonderful, Mm. you know, and I I really love what you're saying. And, you know, you should be prime minister. And, you know, all of these kind of compliments. I was always, yeah, I was always quite in my head about that. There was even something about that. Even the positive response, you know, felt Mm. like it could be crippling in some way uh, or at least you know, could I could see that it could have the the potential to suffocate my voice right. in many ways and, and, and direct me as to, you know, rather than speaking about what I want, I'm then starting to think about what does my audience want, yeah. you know? And I never wanted that at all. And I think that's why I've been a lot more quiet on social media recently. I might return. I think there's a good chance that I will because I'm back in the thinking space. I needed to take some time mm. away. Um, But that for me, you know, the way that it can, you know, you recognize that, you know, people like something and you give them more of that. Mm. And all of a sudden you find yourself in a space where you're like, is this what I set out to do? You know, and you find yourself in the company of people who agree with you, um, but we're not coming from the same place, uh, but they thinking that we are. You can arrive at the same conclusion as many people, uh, but definitely traveling on different buses to get there, Mm -hmm. you know? And the more that, you know, although I don't tweet and use the internet very much in the way that I once did, you know, I observe it every now and then, and there seems to be something about using the platform daily and constantly Um, I think of this as maybe a problem of the fact that youth culture has become mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and so there is something about social media that seems to, you know, infantilize people in a way. And all of a sudden you're speaking to people in ways that are just, you just never would in real life. I like, oh, yeah, there's so many threads. I mean, I had a little thing about this the other day because someone disagreed with something that I wrote and their disagreement comment was girl bye I was like we're adults we're adults like I understand on the one hand hey have fun whatever you know like you're not really here to write a dissertation to me in the Instagram comments I'm not gonna do it to you either so in some ways the fact that we're set up to not actually have meaningful conversations in social media facilitates that um that type of interaction that's not meant to go anywhere further than Mm. just girl bye Mm -hmm. you know or just yes queen you know where it's just like (laughs) praise or punishment that's it right there's no depth right and you know what something that also comes to mind and I, i actually i to to make my point and to feel like i'm being true to what i'm about to say I do have to acknowledge you, Aisha, because you, I came across you in mid-2019 when I was still very deep in my own ideological capture, 
but there was something it's almost like that's around the time that I started to feel like there's there's something inside me that is sort of crying out to be expressed, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I thought it was, um, again, in line with everything else that I was doing around social justice. I, I couldn't have named it at the time. Um, and then I came across an interview that you did or a conversation that you were having, and it made me uncomfortable initially because that thing, whatever that thing internally for me was, suddenly started to rise to the surface but again it was just very visceral it was like a feeling but I knew that there was something here in your message that I needed to listen to and I was reintroduced to your work again in early 2020 when I was having conversations with my partner at the time and he asked me if I'd heard about you and he showed me a conversation or your Twitter you were quite active probably more so on Twitter at the time and without even needed to, needing to go into the specifics of what you were saying, I immediately felt the warmth. You were very direct, you were very convicted, but you had this innate warmth with your words. And you have a very philosophical way of viewing the world, which is just how my own brain works. And immediately I felt freer in my mind. Before I even liberated my tongue, I felt <laughs> free in my mind because of you. Um, so I just have to thank you because for me, you have, blaze the trail in a in a beautiful and quiet and intentional way which is what speaks to me and by the time that i found you in 2020 the very same approach and i say this to say i think that's the thread that joins mm. us together mm. in that we use our voices very differently but um there's an innate curiosity and that curiosity is is kind of wrapped up in warmth and a playfulness and something mischievous about it as well and it, it just feels like a hug, mm. you know, it feels like a hug, but it feels very firm. And um, today, three years, nearly four years on since writing my open letter, which a lot of people listening to this might know me from, I can only count three people. The both of you and a wonderful, wonderful man who's a friend of ours, Will Roosh, who's mm. um, um, a high school teacher in the US, these are the people that I truly believe I can look at today and say they allow for me to remain in integrity because they embody integrity. Um, because another thing that I think social media does, which I was very intentional to make sure I don't get caught up in, that validation can be so dangerous, just as dangerous as people um, ripping you apart and misrepresenting you and, and warping and distorting your words. I knew that I didn't want to leave one echo chamber and immediately go into another. But I was also not um, naive to the fact that naturally I am going to end up in an echo chamber just because of the platforms where we're speaking, they're designed in such mm -hmm. a way where you can't really avoid it. Um, but I knew that for me, I'm not seeking a platform. If you knew how many people, and I wonder what it's like for both of you, people that say things like, you should be on TikTok or you should start a YouTube <laughs> or have you thought about, you could make this bigger, you know? Have, I, I have no desire to make anything bigger. <laughs> if people really knew me, they wouldn't even ask me such a question. I'm so simple. I enjoy the pace that I'm doing things. I'm here to actually explore ideas. I'm also here to um, just master my craft as a writer, as a thinker. I want to learn to write in long form instead of these short bursts, mm -hmm. which is why I resonate with you. I want to actually test out my ideas, but not from a intellectual perspective, because I, I don't see it in that way. I see it as just having conversations with my friends, hanging out with my friends, being able to actually exist in the world and to see what I'm saying online, is that actually true for reality? And that takes time, that takes time. It's so mundane, it's not sexy, it's not me thinking about content. I'm not a content <laughs> creator, I'm not an influencer. Um, I don't even consider myself as supposed intellectual. I've found myself in this space accidentally as a writer, as a speaker, but I don't wear that as an identity, you know, in the same way that we speak about not over attaching ourselves to certain identities, ideological identities. 
I don't see myself as an intellectual now I'm part of this group. I, I just don't. And I've tried and been very intentional about staying away from that. Mm. And I've seen both of you model that really, really well. Oh, I'm so really honored. well. This yeah. is a love fest mm. right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really is. Yeah, no, yeah. and and I'm I'm so touched and and moved by what you said and and resonate so deeply. I uh, first and foremost, I definitely don't consider myself to be an intellectual, yeah. um, even though I may have intellectual interests. Right. Um, and I'm inspired or at least intrigued by a lot of intellectual minds. Um, but I think I'm much more of a feeler than mm. a thinker. Um, or maybe that's not fair to say, maybe it's both, but I think what I tend to notice with a lot of people in the idea space is that they pride themselves on their intellect so much that they neglect the heart space mm -hmm. yes. because that doesn't feel sophisticated. And how do you use mm. it online? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where does it go online? Right. I think and that's a whole part of it too. We have this medium that is so dominant in words and intellectualism, yes. just ideas and showing ideas, right? You can't, it's very hard to embody your philosophy online in a way. And I yes. think that really is training us to just overemphasize words and intellectualism and forget, you know, yeah, you're saying something that's right, but how does it feel when you say it? How mm. does it feel when you say it to this person in this way? How does it feel when you spend all your time, you know, looking at the same thing over and over again and being like, yes, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there something fresh there? Are you, are you discovering something new? Are you growing? Mm. or are you just in this weird feedback loop where it's like I like this thing I like this thing I like it seems very in some ways devoid of real life to me which is what I think yes. you're kind of touching on too yes and that that line you said I'd love to just hear you expand on that more because mm -hmm. I really felt it in my body when you said um paraphrasing but it 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 feels better for certain people to almost focus on the mind than the body and how it feels, the more um, somatic experience of things because it's not sophisticated yeah. enough. Yes, mm. I've seen that. So I've yeah, I, that. I definitely think, you know, the intellectual often feels that anything that isn't very high-minded uh, and anything that has uh, a focus on love or a focus on connection is cringe essentially mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and unsophisticated um and i just don't resonate with that i think for me i've always you know why it was so moving to hear what you said about how you felt when you came across me because um that's what i wanted people to mm -hmm. feel you know i've mm -hmm. never been expressing myself for people who already agree with me to kind mm -hmm. of give me a pat on the back i, yes. I don't think that's interesting to me at all um I've always wanted to just, I don't know, um, to be felt, you know? I guess there was a lot in the world that I didn't, I wasn't feeling, you know? And I've, I've put myself out there in a way to connect with people. Um, and I think you lose a lot. I think that's where a lot of intellectuals are going wrong. You know, if they truly do want to persuade people, encourage people to, you know, to be more open-minded and things like that. I think they're going in the wrong way about it because they're performing for other intellectuals, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess as much as intelligence, you know, is is useful, you know, it's not a virtue in that way. Mm -hmm. And I find wisdom, you know, a lot more interesting and intellect doesn't produce that. You know, yeah. if anything, it can um, work against that. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think, you know, wisdom is, is is mind and heart yeah. um and so yeah that's why as much as there are lots of people in this space that i resonate with ideas wise or at least we agree I, maybe i shouldn't say resonate with but at least we agree but i've found it very hard to to resonate and to relate to them to yes. their way of um expressing their ideas um i often if i'm honest don't see it very different from the thing that they are opposed to i don't see it very different at all um i see it as the same actually uh, increasingly more so um and you two especially because i feel the exact same way about you Gosh. both you know mm. when i first came across um salome you know i think i came across her before i came across you mm. um and yeah it was beautiful to me because i don't think i saw anyone who um was expressing themselves in that particular way, it mm -hmm. always seemed to come with some sark. It always came mm. to seem to come with some ironic sort of detachment. And poetic. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah. And beauty. Exactly. I, there was a time actually, maybe your earlier sharings, that I saw where you would reference beauty mm. quite a lot. Mm. 
and I it was just so refreshing because you were still talking about the thing mm -hmm. what's happening in society but it was also just it was timeless it was timeless and it was not pointing the finger you know um and you were including yourself in that instead of looking down right as if you have never experienced the thing that you're talking about. And it was just, yeah, it was just very different. Mm. And it's hard, it's seemingly hard to maintain that online. It seems like mm -hmm. your audience mm. or maybe your own ego starts to push you further and further into extremes because as you yes. said, the validation can be mm -hmm. very um, addictive. And I was always, I was always skeptical about that validation. Yeah. And I, I guess I don't believe it in many ways because you know, they know one, side of me mm. and if they knew other ideas and other ways that i felt about things it would completely <laughs> diminish that idea right. that they have of me so i've always been a little distrusting of um even the compliments you know i, I know people are well intended uh when they when they when they give them to me um but i've tried not to internalize mm. them as best as i can and it's difficult that isn't to say that i don't sometimes mm -hmm. or isn't to say that you know if I see that something I've put out has resonated with people, that's not to say that it doesn't make me, me feel good. Yeah. Um, but I think what I'm in this for is connection. Absolutely. I think that's the thing that genuinely makes me feel alive. It's very life affirming mm. to me. And I think the whole reason in general, maybe why I even started expressing myself is, or one of them should I say, is because I found a lot of the ideas that were permeating to be uh, the opposite of life affirming, mm. you know, quite life denying right. in that way. Mm. Ugh, oh my gosh, it's so much. It's so much. I don't even know where to take <laughs> yeah. it. I don't even Me know where to too. take I it. I, need a I wish we could just <laughs> keep really recording for that, hours to really let that marinate because it. Everything you're saying, when both of you speak, the reason why I know that I'm drawn to you both for, for the right reasons is because I feel it in my body mm. before I can even intellectualize it, which I think is good. I think that's a very good thing. And what you're saying, I it made me curious about you actually in that, have you found that when you share certain aspects of you or your life or your thoughts, you will have people drop off or you will have people expressing disappointment because you're not quite fitting into the expectations they have constantly. and what are those and what are those specific things yeah constantly wonderful question thank you for turning around the whole thing on me <laughs> yes 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 so i mean i i completely feel exactly what you're talking about and i have a really strange bittersweet relationship with social media because of this because on the one hand it's connected me with both of you mm -hmm. and so that's that amazing connection and that power it's like this very universal power I, i've never even been to london before we were connecting right it's amazing to me and i consider you guys both role models and friends mm -hmm. it's just so moving to me that a piece of technology could do that but at the same time this technology is uh, very destructive in other ways and I've felt it um, I have the same thing that you have where you just go silent sometimes because it's it seems as if I can't find my voice in the medium you know if I'm with a pen and paper I'm fine if I'm in the world I'm fine but when I go into this medium of social media it seems like uh, you know a hostile strange place where where there's these patterns of behavior that are expected from me and so if I veer from that you get oh this is so unexpected or oh no I'm disappointed in you mm -hmm. I remember I posted something recently that was this very kind of like um a single line in a long caption maybe um four paragraph caption for a video related to free speech the one line was um, when I once, you know, looked at socialism as having a lot of answers for me. Later, I found libertarianism answered these uh, questions I had in a much more uh, interesting and compelling way to me. That was it. I was disappointing. I was just another ideologue. I was, you know, not answering people, not giving the, the criticism that they needed. I, I was like, immediately there was this kind of... Um, 
you're not being what we came here for you to be. Mm, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and I find that so strange and stifling um, because I'm not there for anyone else at the yeah. end of the day. You know, I'm there to express myself in a weird new medium and to try to articulate my own ideas. I find social media can be so useful as a journal. You know, as a log yes. of my own thoughts where I'm figuring out how can I put this into this character limit? How can I fit this in an image and, and, you know, articulate this idea or feeling in this strange medium? And then to have someone come in and say, this is disappointing. <laughs> I don't care. Like, this is not what I'm here for. I'm not right. here to disappoint or, or to please even on the, you know, right. to your point about how praise can have this equally um, controlling effect. I have the same thing. Mm. I don't check my notifications. Mm. I'm Me very neither. weird about it. Me I neither. will check the post and that's how I'll like answer comments. Right. I don't open the notifications because they have such an emotional impact on me. Just like seeing the number, opening it up and seeing a bunch of things. I can't. Yeah. So yeah. I've had exactly that where, you know, I'll get messages from people that want to have an intense debate with me about one line in a caption that I wrote. And I'm like, girl, I ain't got time for that. <laughs> like, <laughs> bless your heart. I, I appreciate that you're interested in this. I would lose my mind if I answered every person. Right. And so in that way, it's so clearly not an appropriate use of the medium. Yeah. Because if everybody sends me their disappointment or like, hey, but wait, I want to have this debate. This is my beyond full time job. So it's clearly not what the best use of that medium is for. It's, it's not going to work in that mm. way. Um, and so I have found it to be um, a really strange it feels like you're working with black magic you know mm -hmm. it has this weird black magic energy of like this is powerful but this could also destroy me yes that's a great way to put it and you know what i i really experienced this firsthand at different points actually i've experienced this because three years ago when i wrote my open letter people would have really known and i've said this quite a few times but they would have known what to do with me if it was a case of someone leaving the left mm. and slotting quite neatly into the right then it would have just made sense you know but when people found out found out i mean it's <laughs> what i talk right? about that i have sex with women that i sometimes grow the hair under my arms that i have a shaved head then suddenly it was like where uh, do you fit where do you quite fit but let's give it some more time when you know people listen to me for a little bit longer and see that i enjoy saying the word fuck quite mm -hmm. a bit um and the most recent thing that happened that really showed me this which resulted in me losing um and i use the word losing very very loosely but so that we all understand what I'm talking about, losing just under a thousand followers mm. or something like that in a couple of hours. When I married two of my best friends, oh, wow. two oh, of I my, that. yeah, it's beautiful. it was beautiful. One of the most profound experiences of my mm. entire life, my dear friends, Andrew and Tosin, um, two young black queer men. And I had the pleasure of officiating their wedding and I shared the beautiful wedding video. And I am lucky enough in many ways that, you know, in my own little echo chamber that I've ended up creating, I have people that are very open. I have people that are very understanding and respectful despite, you know, our differences. And because I put my boundaries very openly and clearly with my audience, I tell them that I do not infantilize mm -hmm. people, but I do it in a very respectful way, not in a patronizing way, you know. Um, so a lot of people, it's not as if anyone commented anything. It was just the silent mm -hmm. show of, I don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. I was with you, but this is where I personally draw the line. Mm -hmm. um, and I just found that very fascinating, but also mm -hmm. not surprising because again, a lot of people that lean politically right, even though I do not see my work as political at all, yeah. which is really mm -hmm. frustrating at times, um, they had a certain expectation of me. You know, they had us, maybe they were like, Africa, we can put up with the fact <laughs> that you show your nipples every now and again <laughs> through your outfits. We can put up with the underarm hair. We can put up with the talks of sex and sexuality. But this is where I personally draw the line. Mm -hmm. And I just found that very interesting. And it actually made me realize there was a realization, but I was also very thankful 
that in the very beginning of me, because I started sharing about sobriety and self-sabotage seven years ago, I was not doing this to build a platform. Mm. I was not doing this to one day have an audience and to monetize and to scale. And that's, I did it as a personal journal to share um, and then was led into being a specialist in some of the things that I'm fascinated with. But it made me so thankful that I have such a healthy detachment to the praise, but to also um, the other side of that. But it's been so interesting that each time that I post a podcast episode, um, where I'm exploring sexuality, something that I've been doing for seven years. I'll have a lot of people drop off mm. because again, maybe they found a post that they thought I'm speaking to, um, I'm demonizing the left, <laughs> you know? So they're like, okay, she's one of us. <laughs> and then I sort of just shattered their perception. So I, I, I find it interesting, but it also feels good because it shows me that, okay, I get to I get to be myself mm -hmm. here and it's fine if you got something from me at one point in time and then I show you a part of myself that makes you think mm, maybe we're not as aligned as I thought um, but it's just it to me it's also fleeting it means if I'm to be completely honest whether it's my platform the numbers in terms of the following it means something and that I appreciate it. It shows me that my work and my words are validated, but it also means nothing mm. in the grand scheme of things. It could all go away today. I promise you, I would I would be just as happy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, like how many likes a post has mm -hmm. or whether people are sharing it or not. As soon as I share a post, immediately I go in to hide the likes. I don't mm -hmm. need to see, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't need to see any of that, you know? Um, but I find a lot of beauty in understanding that it, it really does all mean something and nothing at mm -hmm. the same time. I yeah, it's so free. Yeah, it's funny that you say that about people dropping off. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that, again, has made me distance myself from social media a bit yeah. is that you start to realize, oh, I'm a dog in your fight. Mm -hmm. You know, essentially, that's it. You know, and I'm mm. here to connect with people and even podcasts. I, I found myself... Yes less willing mm. to kind of go on people's podcasts and mm -hmm. chat because I'm probably going on your podcast because if I like your ideas, then I'm interested in you. Yes. I'm interested in how you got there. You know, I'd like to know you as a person and, and what has been your journey through life that has brought you here and your ingredients essentially. Um, but then when I started realizing, okay, people want me on their podcast, but they don't want to know me, you know, <laughs> right. and I'm not necessarily, I'm not doing this for popularity. I mean, I think maybe the difference is like, from when I was, you know, throughout my educational career, I've always found myself in the popular circles, yeah. you know, and there is something about popularity, at least in my experience, that has not actually been good for me. I think it's been the thing that's mm. often hidden me from myself. And what I mean by that is, you know, when I was young in, in, in high school, secondary school, mm -hmm. and I am, you know, within the popular circles, you know, there are certain things that, you know, they just don't discuss. Yes. And so I remained alienated from myself for a really long time. But because I've always had popularity amongst friends or creative mm. scenes and things like that, this isn't, you know, having it online, again, although it represents something, it's not, I'm not avenging kind of like uh, this uh, past of when I was yes. like, I don't know, when I was maybe perceived as like a loser or when I didn't have friends or I don't know, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing from high school I need to make up for, mm. you know. And when I started seeing that, yeah, you're just kind of a dog in people's fight. And as long as you're not, if you're not posting about what they followed you for, like, I don't know. I just found right. the whole thing very, um, very icky because that's just not how I maneuver. Um, and so, yeah, no, I just to say, like, I, I completely agree, Gosh, you yeah. know, and I do think that's probably one of the things that makes you know, because I think we were saying it earlier, there are many people that we found interesting online that we might have resonated with and over time, mm -hmm. much less so, <laughs> you know, and I, I think a part of that is um, a lot of people have never experienced this, you know, mm. this sudden overnight mm -hmm. popularity and, you know, what feels like fame in right. some yes. way and, and maybe it is, yes. you know to some degree, that's not something everybody has had. And even famous people often get trained, mm -hmm. there's media training, mm -hmm. right. you know, and you know, people have just had this overnight. And I think a lot of the time we're using it to kind of, how should I say, 
and it validates something that we didn't have before, which mm. is maybe why the whole place can feel very high school in many 100%. ways. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. feels very hurt. Yeah, Social yeah. media has a lot of hurt energy, right. especially in the more idea spaces. Mm. You know, I find myself desperately looking to recurate my news feeds constantly because I will keep somehow being sent down these news feeds where I'm like, I don't want to see all this anger i don't want to see all this hurt i don't want to see these willful misinterpretations of the other side mm. this is not interesting to me it's not useful it's not insightful and so i desperately go through social media constantly trying to find like weird accounts that i was like we're posting pictures of trees auras mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah, completely yeah. random things i'm like feed me something new i don't care what it is i just need to see something that's different mm. um especially when you do creative work you know you can't get stuck in these weird echo chambers um where it's it's worse than an echo chamber because it has this this element of training you to say what is the thing to say today yes. and speak in the language also of what the discourse is. And that is probably to me as a writer, one of the most frustrating things is to realize that there is a there's an influence that tries to get you to use language in a certain way that maybe you otherwise would not have used it and um you know whether it's slogans or concepts that are represented by certain terms mm. um something to me comes to mind like privilege mm. privilege was a thing that um seems great as an idea but the more and more i looked into it i was like well we all have privilege and we all have disadvantages too right and disadvantages and advantages works very well to calculate that because it's a lot more nuanced in a way um, because I know some very privileged people who have very underprivileged lives at the same time. Mm -hmm. How do I, are they privileged or not? You know, yes. how do I encapsulate both of those things with that term? And so I found that certain words like this would, would force a framework that removed other things from the reality of the situation that removed the nuance that removed the room for questioning um and and if you accept the terminology it's like you kind of get locked into this worldview mm. and um i've just kind of you know more and more want to reject this this feeling of influence and control that comes through social media which is these are the words you're supposed to use these are the mm. topics we're supposed to talk about this is the angle from which we talk about these topics and i think both of you speak so um beautifully to the way that social media tries to make you into a stick person like a mm. straw man figure that's like you're a right-wing commentator you're um the token black non-leftist you're the um anti-communist cuban girl and it's just like <laughs> can i right. be me <laughs> maybe yeah. like how about this really simple idea that i just do not become whatever stereotype is going to affirm your really limited view of me also yeah. so right how do you do so how do you do that even if you're um let's say you're future casting from now and you think about how you want to continue sharing what does that look like for you now that you've been sharing in a certain way for a few years we were saying the reason we got together is because we're excited about something new coming mm. out of this conversation right because we don't want to keep on saying the same thing over and mm -hmm. over and over again finding new and creative ways of saying the same thing which i think has merit i think mm. it is important mm. because it can feel like everyone has had this before i i think the same thing of self-censorship which is just to me something that I'm so fascinated with because I do believe that it underpins a lot of the things that are happening. And because I've been exploring it in my own mind and with my audience for a while now and self-sabotage for even longer, nearly a decade, I sometimes, my brain can trick me into thinking everyone already knows these <laughs> things. But it's, it's actually so not yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> the average person is not walking around and saying, oh, I've been self-censoring today. <laughs> but they have no idea. So you have to break it down in ways that people will understand. Have you ever found yourself editing your thoughts? Do you feel like you're walking on eggshells? Do you feel like there's a sense of kind of surveillance sometimes when you're talking to your friends? Or um, do you find yourself withholding things that you really want to say, but you're afraid that you're going to be maybe punished in some way? I understand that as a writer and as a speaker, 
I do have to find new and interesting ways to say the same thing. But I think what we specifically mean is that kind of just harping on a very mm-hmm. specific part of it, but in a very, if you can picture that pointed finger, right. we all know what it feels like when you read something and a part of you does resonate, but it just feels like there's kind of no hope, you know, mm-hmm. right. the hopelessness that I there's don't- There's no growth I in it. Yeah, there's no growth, there's no hope. And it's all, it, it keeps people in that um, space of self-righteousness, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so what does sharing look like? I'd love to hear from both of you. What does sharing look like for you as you think about it in the future, even thinking about creating things that maybe people would have never expected for you to put out into the world? Um, I love doja cat's instagram usage oh me too you know what i don't i don't follow her so i don't know what's her usage like it's absurd really it's nonsensical okay it's vaguely offensive in a way that you can't articulate (laughs) yes Yes. it's so uniquely her it's clearly just fun Mm. she's having so much fun with it and um i really appreciate that recapturing of social media mm. as like bringing back like the zanga energy do you remember zanga.com yes. or live journal yes. or myspace even mm. these spaces that didn't have um that same instant feedback process mm-hmm. where yeah. post all your likes all your comments potential to go viral across right. you know the world with people having conversations with you that it's like i would never be friends with you don't worry about this yeah. like we're not we're not on the same page that's okay go do your journey I'm doing mine, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, there's this weird pressure on social media that we all have to be on the same page. We all have to be um, understood by each other. Right. If we're not understood, if, if I don't understand you, you're doing something wrong. And it's just, I like to remove the audience, which is why I don't check my notifications. I'm really terrible that. about my DMs. I'm not so great Me about too. my comments. And I often feel like I need to apologize to my followers because there is that weird... Um, you know, as much as I appreciate the support they give me in the comments, you know, these beautiful comments of how much they appreciate my mm. writing and how much it resonates and how much it does for them. Um, there is this this sense of, ah, do I need to reciprocate this now? I need to answer you, yeah. you know, because I'm grateful for it. It's so mm. nice. Um, but it's not what I'm there for. And it starts to set up this pattern where... I know I'm going to post and then I know that there's going to be this feedback. I don't want the feedback even. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want the feedback, I will seek it. I will intentionally ask for it. Um, If I just want to post some stuff where I'm like weirdly working out an idea that's half baked and Mm. I want to see it physically represented, you know, put into words and published like that then that's for me. It's an exploration. Um, I look at social media a lot as an experiment, um, as an art project, as something for fun. And that's what keeps me from getting stuck in this very rote pattern of, do you know that free speech is good? Because I know that free speech is good. Let's talk about how it's just like, we know, we know. Like, tell me about what it does for you. Tell me the story behind it. Tell me something new. What did you just see in the world today that showed you that free speech is so important? You you know, like, let's bring life into it. And that, to me, uh, ties in with your, your description of that common tone of the pointed finger with Mm. these ideas that, you know, a lot of these ideas, they're things that I hold, yet I feel completely at odds with uh, the more political, whatever sphere of social media that often are talking about these ideas because they don't talk about them in a way that I want to talk about them. It's this rigidity, right? right? There's no room for, okay, I see... um, whatever let's talk about taxes or something let's talk about healthcare. let's talk about relationship power dynamics whatever it is Mm. but let's talk about it with room for each other's perspective Mm -hmm. as opposed to this strict narrow rigid this is the only way i am right and i'm going to set up this dynamic that if you don't agree you are wrong immediately Mm -hmm. um so for me it's just how can i keep my expression as um a mode of questioning mm. as a mode of exploration as yes. opposed to that preaching and scolding and just really it's kind of like a hurt again it's this hurt energy right because it's yeah it's already premeditating the backlash when you come with that energy of this is the way and if you don't know that you're part of the problem mm. you're already premeditating the backlash there's a fear in it right there's this fear energy there's this hurt energy mm. and i find that i worry even that 
having that become the dominant way we talk about these ideas trains people to adopt these hurt yes. af- afraid modes of being and they don't even realize that you know there's another way to talk about things and it doesn't have to be hurt it doesn't have to be rageful or fearful mm. you do a great job of that and i'd love I want Aisha to answer that same mm-hmm. question of, you know, the social media, how you use that. And then I'd like to also pose, um, you know, a question for, for you guys, which is how do you find um, what perspective do you come from for discussing ideas that are often really contentious and, and that people generally have very rigid, um, often hostile responses to um any any difference in opinion on Mm. how do you navigate that in a way that allows for the conflict but um doesn't go down that path of just like well you this and you that Mm. i don't know if this is directly asking answering africa's question but it does touch on something we Mm. were speaking about not long ago around privilege and language And, and one of the things that I, or one of the only ways I think that you combat kind of falling, you know, going from one camp into another is is speaking in your own words. And that's something that I don't think, you know, people on both sides do very much. And I think if you can manage to continue to speak in your own words, and so even, you know, whether it's like, I don't know, the way that the left uses problematic, or even the way that <laughs> the people on the right use the word right. base and mm. virtue city and all these <laughs> kind of things, what these things do when you use the language that is associated with either camp is that people stop listening. They mm. start projecting yes. onto mm. your statements. And I think um, to continue to speak in my own words, you know, is is how I, I'd like to go forward on social media. I've never really had a plan. And like you, Africa, I didn't intend to kind of, you know, build a following. I was seeking connection, Mm. you know, um, and I guess putting things out there was almost like, you know, putting out a fishing rod and seeing what comes back, you know, and that's all it was for me. Um, And yeah, there's no, there's no plan. You know, I still kind of feel um, awkward, you know, because I get the same advice of like, you have a following now. Like, <laughs> maximize, maximize, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All the time. And I remember actually, I stopped, I stopped um, tweeting and Instagramming a lot at a point where I was like, maybe it was like 110,000 on Instagram mm. or something like that. And it really freaked, freaked me out if I was honest. And, you know, for every month that I didn't post, it's going down. It's going down. Mm. It's going down. And you have this sense of, should I do something? Right. You know, should I should, should I get them back? Mm. And I really resented that. Oh my you gosh. know, I resented that that feeling was there. And I would I would resist that because it's like, no, I don't have anything to say. And I can't force out mm. anything to say because um, mm. it doesn't feel right to me. And so, yeah, I just hope that I can... I don't know, whatever interests me, there's no, there's never been much rhyme or reason to it, if I'm honest. I've just gone on, on what I felt and, and that's that's been beneficial for me so far. Um, but yeah, I, I really, really would stress the importance of speaking in your own words if, yes. you, if you want to connect with people. Um, yeah, uh, but in terms of your question of, if you wouldn't mind repeating it, you said. Yeah, so. I'm really curious because a lot of us talk about ideas that are contentious Mm -hmm. and to your point about speaking in your own words, I think that's part of the Mm -hmm. answer. Um, But what do you find is the best strategy for speaking about ideas, being honest about how you feel, but doing it from a place that doesn't position you as an antagonist, Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily put the other person in the position of being defensive where they have Mm. to now respond because you've set up a dynamic where they are the enemy Mm -hmm. how do you deal with that that um, navigation of conflict in these ideas i think you have to express or at least for me i i'm not naive to or ignorant about my own shittiness (laughs) you know and my own darkness and my own bullshit and the many ways that it manifests um and so long as you have that Mm. in mind when you are speaking to people uh i'm not above any of the things that people think you know i could have been there before but even if i haven't been there before i've been in other spaces that are equally at least in my view as destructive Mm. and so i think you know i think it helps or I've always just come from the space of, 
of that. I've, I've always been aware of my own darkness, so to speak. Um, and I, I think that's the, um, I think that's always underneath what I'm saying. And, and when you're aware of that, it's very hard to talk down to people, mm. you know, and I see myself yes. in a lot of people, you know, I've never not, um, uh, so, you know, great people, some of the worst people, you know, like I, I see myself in them. Um, and so that for me, like, it's not, I guess I'm just very interested in people thinking and feeling and I don't get what, I don't see what I would get from making people feel like shit, mm. you know, I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. aware that like, you know, any you note, know, just as, 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 as simplistic as it is, like, you know, people are going through so much, I'm not Gosh. someone who finds life mm. easy, you know what I mean, and so I can imagine that other people don't either, um, and I'm very interested in, um, I don't know, um, being what I don't see enough of, mm. you know, like mm. what I would want, you know, uh, if I was if I was looking for something, you know, what is it that I'm looking for? And whatever it is that I'm looking for, why don't I embody that? That's yeah. an artist's answer. Right? Yeah. And something comes to mind to Gosh. me as we speak about this. It sounds like a lot of the problems we have with social media is that we have this creative, artistic perspective on life and our work, which is we're in conversation with ourselves a lot. We're seeking things. We're curious. We're not um, rigid about what could come. Mm -hmm. That's an art practice. Yes. That's how you do art and but we're doing it in a medium that's a lot like advertising and marketing and it has this very like business you know what i mean social media is in some ways a tool of business Absolutely. very much and Absolutely. yet we're trying to express ourselves and and do this art practice yeah. in a business space in some regard yes and people and then you have this entire other element with the the whole parasocial relationship where you've got an audience of people that are kind of getting trained in a way to react to things that they don't agree with with outrage as if that thing didn't exist yeah. pre-social media i mean people that you didn't agree with have been around forever yeah. they weren't you know brought into existence by social media it's just now they're in front of you and you have the capacity to respond to them in a way you never did before and um i guess in some ways we're just like how do you keep the creative perspective alive while still um being in this in this environment that is in some ways really kind of stifling to the creative mm. perspective i i think and this actually ties in very neatly with two of the previous questions because for me i realized that um sometimes a lot of this is a platform issue mm. in the sense that on my podcast or if i can have a long-form conversation it allows me to have moments of pause it allows me to actually explore the idea. It's like a tapestry, right? It allows me to actually pull one thread and then the other and then the other without rushing myself or trying to force something into a infographic um, or just one sentence. So I've found that for me and the way that I want to continue in the future is to just without rushing myself, without making it a business strategy, without getting other people's input into what they think Africa should be, to just explore different mediums, right? Um, I would like to do more things in person, even gatherings. I'm someone that doesn't do big groups very well. I can do it if I have to do my job and I do it, etc. but I like this. Mm -hmm. I like small intimate gatherings. So I'd like to do more of that and just actually talk with people. And I, I also want to continue sharing in the way that I do because to me, that feels true. It's never changed. It's still the same way that I shared seven years ago. Um, people probably and did have more of me in 2020, 21 and 22. And that makes sense. We were in lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I was sharing in a way um, that was very regular. And I just don't do that anymore because I'm not in the same place. And it's not because I'm so busy here, there and everywhere. I just don't share in that way online all the time. Um, and I think... I just want to continue respecting my natural rhythm, which really is slowness. It's mm. really intentionality. Mm. When I was, um, when I made the decision to write a book, I remember my editor and my agent saying things like, by the way, we do have to warn you, the publishing world, things take a long time. I'm so <laughs> sorry, it can take four years. I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's exactly what I, I don't want to be rushed. And with my words, like I was saying earlier, 
I want to actually master my craft. I want to be a better writer. This year, I want to sign up for writing courses. John Ronson's actually going to be in mm. London doing like a writing workshop. Um, and I signed up for it so I can go and learn. I want to be in the world learning, mm. not on social mm. media, yeah. learning in that way, which I can get a lot of important lessons, but I want to just come offline with my ideas. They've lived online for long enough. And I think it's just time to transfer them elsewhere and really test them out properly. So I want to do that. I would love to write a film. I really want to make a film. I want to fictionalize some of the concepts that I write so about. Awesome. Um, I make music. I want to make music. I know you do too. Mm. I know you do too. Our friend Winston has been trying to get us in the studio. Yeah. Has we been able to get you? Well, we did. We That's haven't awesome. picked it up, but like, yeah. yeah, I think we'll go back in. But yeah, I'll <laughs> yes. talk to you about it after. Yes. So definitely come oh down one gosh, day. Oh my gosh, I yes. love that. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make art. Yeah. I mm. think communication and writing and my work is an art form. I want to start respecting it as that. Mm. I think I've built a strong foundation. I think all of us have. We're so lucky, but also not so lucky because it's taken work, but I will use that word. We're lucky in that we've built something from a place of integrity, something mm -hmm. that is so strong. I think we get to play. Mm -hmm. I really think we get to play now and we get to develop these ideas if we want to. And I know I do. Um, and I think a big part of my success, similar to Aisha, I don't get any pushback at all. And if I do, I can't see it. I mean, I don't <laughs> go onto Reddit. I don't search for it. But I don't get it, you know, in, in really evident ways. And I really do think that's because even in my writing and especially my videos, I'm just having a chat. Mm -hmm. That's how my work, I'm actually just having a chat. In, in my mind and how I write, it's exactly how I speak. Even with both of you, how you write is exactly <laughs> how you speak. Um, I laugh a lot. So even in my videos, if even if I'm talking about something really contentious, it's just me and my tea at home. And I'm like, oh, I have something to say. Let's see, let's see what happens. And I never know what I'm going to say, but I laugh a lot. I think all of this is so absurd. Even the fact that we're sitting here <laughs> having a chat about this and then we'll all just go off and, you know, I find it all just, again, it means something, but nothing at the mm -hmm. same time, which is why I always laugh. Um, and I think that that openness and just warmth and that, feeling of just having a chat can be felt in my work even when I am in my role of consultant and mentor and I want to get this idea out there because I think it's important on a practical level I think that can be felt mm -hmm. you know so I think there's something quite contagious about that about that kind of energy it can be picked up on even with mm -hmm. people that don't like me I have a feeling mm -hmm. they do. They do. <laughs> That's a great perspective to yeah, take, yeah, yeah. nonetheless. <laughs> My haters actually like yeah, they yeah. keep coming I back. love it. Yeah, right, I right. We have yeah, people that so keep good. they mm -mm -mm. keep coming back for some reason. So I, I find that quite cute. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. You do a good job of articulating what is the absurdist philosophy. Right. Things mean nothing and something at the same time. And because of that, the only rational response is to play. Yes. To indulge it. Yes. And you 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 really do a great job of embodying that in such an infectious way. Mm. Um and in some ways, like I'm gonna get real real with you. Please. Um it it how can i say this it fascinates me and slightly makes me defensive mm, because you're me. so open and you're so warm and playful that there's something in me sometimes it's like <laughs> <laughs> it resists <laughs> yes yes i'm like is this a real person is this a psyop is it like where's this where's the trick where's the trick what's going on here because it's so it's so rare mm. it's so rare most people go through the world so guarded mm. so on the defense so kind of like concealed you know just a little more concealed and you just lay it on the table and you you have this really resilient um spirit to you that mm. You know, when people, if they do want to cast their hate towards you or their disagreement or what it is, I can see how it just rolls off you because you can yeah. take it. You know, there's not that kind of um, fragility that I see in the hostility. You know, there's something really yeah. fragile about hostility. Yes. Because yes. it's like, I have to fight. I have to defend myself. Yeah. I have to be prepared. And you know, you're so unguarded in a way that it's like, that's true power. Mm. That's true safety. 
Thank and you for that reflection. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. agree. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Right. You know what? It's, it ties back into something Aisha said um, about five minutes ago. For me, it's getting sober. Mm. Getting sober nearly seven years ago um, allowed me, forced me and allowed me to confront my own darkness mm -hmm. in ways that I could have never imagined. I thought it was the drugs. I thought it was the alcohol. I thought all of that was to blame for the shitty behavior, for the manipulating, for the p pathological lying, for the kleptomania, for the for all of it. I really truly believed that if I finally get sober, all of that is going to go away. It didn't go anywhere. Mm. It mm. didn't go anywhere. And I had to stop blaming my alcoholic father. Yeah. I had to stop blaming my family who I didn't think were emotionally intelligent mm -hmm. enough. And I, I had to deal with my own shit. And from meeting other addicts, from meeting other people who have truly been to the pits of hell and crawled their way back, mm. I think it just allows for you to not only see your own shadow, but other people's shadow, regardless of who they are, whether you like it or not. So by the time 2018, 19 and 2020 came, when suddenly it seemed like I had forgotten all of that, as if I hadn't been through such a dark place in my life, I, I, that's when I really had to just say, you know what, I'm willing to risk it all so I can be reminded of what I had to face when I was getting sober. But I think that openness, that willingness to laugh, and it's truly open how I am now, I'm like this with my friends, with my partner, and I've really had to fight for it in getting sober. So I, I think that's what's kind of at the root of it. I love that, that's yeah. super powerful. Yeah, I see that. I think, um, I think that that, that openness, I mean, it's so hard earned, mm. you know, you earned that, um, but it's inspiring and I, I see it in you too, Aisha. Yes. It's what yes. draws me to you guys. It's what I think makes um, our way of speaking and particularly the way that you guys are able to stay in these conversations and have been in this space, like, you know, this idea space, which can be so hostile and we've seen it kind of mm. blow up where now you have every day, there's kind of like a new uh, person or whatever yes. that's got their message and they're kind of really loud and mm. really extreme and really hostile. Um, and you guys have remained very consistent mm. in a way that's really graceful to me. It shows that mm. you defend your integrity and your identity um, in a way that's very truthful. You know, you're not letting yourself get manipulated by um, what I feel like is an incredibly manipulative time that we're in. It feels like in a way that I never remember before, I guess, um, really the last few years. Yeah. I never remember there being so much pressure on me to be a certain way, to, to identify a certain way you know to mm. be in a certain camp um it's you know politics has always been a thing but it's gotten so heated um and there's so much less willingness to see people for who they are um as they are now and and strangely in a time where we hear so much about tolerance and inclusivity right. um i feel like i see people more guarded than i remember uh growing up definitely yeah. i feel like there's um, it would be easy for me to become more guarded, you know, than I, than I want to be. Um, and, and I think it's great to see you lead, you know, mm. you guys lead by example in that way of being willing to still deal with whatever the day's concept is, but in a way that's really human. Mm. Um, I think, and, and this will be our, maybe one of our last topics to tie up with, um, is I spoken to you about this idea that I'm working with this black sheep concept. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating to me because I see it in a lot of people that we know. And it's, it's kind of like the archetype that I see people embodying in our space, which is I'm willing to be misunderstood. Mm. I'm willing to be alone on this. Um, I'm willing to be the heretic if it means that I am doing something that feels true and mm. right and is aligned with my values. Um, and it is the path of a true individual. Um, it's a path away from the group. It's a solitary path often, um, but it's, it's an individual path. 
And I see that you guys have definitely done that for yourselves. And I think that's what makes you such compelling. I know you don't want the title, but intellectuals, mm. thinkers, mm -hmm. artists, truly. Um, and I'd love for you to tell me about that experience of being able to be disowned in some ways by different groups, whatever it is, because we all have... Um, identity markers that we're supposed to be a certain way to be whether it's being a woman whether it's being black mm -hmm. whether it's being gay whether it's being left or right or whatever it is there's this expectation about what ideas you're supposed to hold what box you're supposed to fit into and um when i was younger i found that performing those labels um helped me to make up for my own insecurity about who I was mm. and my just general lack of knowledge of who I was. You know, I was like 19. I didn't know who I was. Yeah. But I knew that I was Cuban. I knew that I was a woman. Um, so I could perform these things and I found that ideology was really helpful for that like let me go hardcore into the feminist ideology right. and that's that's me being a woman. And did you? For a while, point? yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I had a very um What did that look like? Because um, I can't see it. <laughs> I want to That's know funny. what that looked like. Yeah, um, I guess it was very uh, your typical feminist in a way, which mm. was um, women always have the short end of the stick. You know, it's kind of this this pessimistic view. Um, women are always subjugated by man, men in some regard. Mm. If there's an outcome that women are not having a good outcome on, it's because of patriarchy. It's because of sexism um, and being very disin or rather um, uncharitable in my interpretations of anything re having to do with men. Okay. So whether it was a man, com a man coming up to me uh, to hit on me or um, some, you know, a man looking at me too long while I'm walking through the store, it would be he's objectifying me he's being gross or mm -hmm. he's being um you know overtly aggressive or dominant or whatever it would be some kind of explanation that was from this like very pes uh, pessimistic feminist line mm -hmm. as opposed to what i do now which is maybe i just look nice you know maybe yeah. i can allow for this to be a more charitable explanation mm -hmm. instead of the most pessimist pessimistic one right which is a lot more helpful for me now because it's less mentally anguished mm. than viewing the world as everything is going to be the worst uh scenario of this um and and you know also now it looks more like embracing the differences between men and women where if you know a man is explaining something to me maybe it's nice to have a guy want to tell me what he's interested in right as opposed to being like this is mansplaining it must be <laughs> that he's trying to take over the conversation and show me i don't know something right which to me speaks to a kind of hurt perspective where mm. if you're over explaining to something to me you are assuming that i don't know it rather than maybe they're insecure and they want to show me that they know something yes or passion you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. there's yeah. so many different yes. explanations. Mm. And so um, rejecting kind of these more pessimistic, um, you know, misogyny is the root of every interaction between men and women or whatever. Um, that kind of perspective was a lot more freeing for me. Um, but yeah, so that was my 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 feminist okay. past. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, w I was curious about that. And when I. Um, I have to think about this one not even too hard because I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever consciously thought about the black sheep um idea and associating it to myself although maybe I've just called it different things because I've definitely mm. always felt like yeah I think it's just a semantics thing for me because I've always thought of myself as an outsider and I only saw that I was an outsider when I saw that I'm attracted to people that are outsiders <laughs> as well. Um, because I'd never, honestly, I'd never really felt like I don't fit in full stop. I just never really noticed, I guess, until again, I started to just attract people that don't quite fit in mm. anywhere, you know? Because something that I'm grateful for is that I've always had this confidence within myself. I've always felt, even though from a young age, when I came to the UK, when I was nine, by the time I was 10, going to school 
and being very aware of my race for the first time in my life, being made fun of, etc. A lot of things that happen to young children, you know, just regardless of race, um, where you're just picked on for different things, picked on for being poor, etc., etc. I still just never, it's almost like it never truly penetrated my self-concept in the way that maybe other children wanted it to. I always had this confidence in myself, even just being alone. Um, I think it's probably around the time where I started to find a lot of safety in my own solitude. I love my own solitude. Sometimes I have to actually be intentional about seeing people <laughs> because I love it so much. But I think I've always had this innate confidence and at the same time always been drawn to people that don't quite fit in in that I've always just seen them as more interesting. Mm -hmm. They always seem to surprise me more. And because I've always been curious, they gave me something that the popular kids couldn't. Mm -hmm. Because when I found myself in those popular spaces because of another kid that was popular, maybe they brought me in in some way, it was always so boring. Mm -hmm. It was always so boring, so flat. We just talk about other people or we talk about maybe hair or how someone looks <laughs> or the bag or whatever mm. it might be. It just never felt exciting. But then if I hang out with someone that isn't as popular and someone that maybe optically, I shouldn't be hanging out with them. It was just much more fun. Mm. We write, we walk around singing. Um, they tell me about the new album they have and we go through the lyrics, you know, in the in the album or it was just more interesting. So I think as I was growing up, I was just drawn to people that have always been the black sheep, either in their family or in their social group. But I know that very much in my household, I was. Mm. I was definitely the black sheep. I didn't quite, um, I didn't quite fit in in the sense that I've always had a rebellious nature, whereas my siblings have never really. Mm -hmm. Or if they did, they kept it very well hidden, but I couldn't, I couldn't hide it. I always had way too many questions. I didn't find it normal that I have to be in school for such long periods of time, even though I've always loved learning, I've always loved reading, but I just couldn't sit in class and just take in information. My tactic to that, which I learned as a kind of as a cognitive tactic is falling asleep. Mm -hmm. Even when I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be tired, but I would just <laughs> fall asleep. So I would get into a lot of trouble and it would just, it would just be very, um, it caused a lot of harm in my home because of how different I was to my siblings who were very, did very good in school. They would be home on time, didn't cause any trouble, didn't fall into that cycle of drinking and then doing drugs, etc., which I did. So I stood out in a lot of ways. But again, I never saw, I never saw it as a burden. I never saw it as, a, as I'm doing something wrong. In fact, I saw it as other people uh, mm -hmm. there's something weird about everyone else um but fast forward now to being a 31 year old woman i i still feel like an outsider but i don't i don't kind of wear it as a badge of honor you know i don't kind of wear it as this thing you know that i forget the character in the breakfast club where he's yeah. very much the outsider mm, yeah, yeah. you know and he kind <laughs> right, it's like his black. thing right, you know? right. yeah <laughs> he is my favorite character in that <laughs> but i didn't kind of wear it as a thing it's only when it's brought to my awareness where I'm like, ah, yeah, right. I, I have been, but I think I've just, I've just kind of been with it for such a long time, you know? Um, so that's kind of my answer, if that even was an answer, okay. but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very fascinating. And I resonate with that a lot. Mm, yeah. Me too. Um, I think in terms, of, there's so much that you said that mm. I resonate with and is, is parallel to my own experience, but I think in terms of where I'm at now that might put me on this space of being an outsider is that I think my desire to understand is much greater than my desire to belong, you know? Mm. And I think rightly or wrongly, I come from a space where I feel like I understand less than other people. So I make more effort to mm. understand, right. you know? Um, and equally, I, I don't, I think, you know, I, was, I spent a lot of my, my younger years very alienated from myself. Mm. And because I'm an only child, my, my, I grew up with just my mum. Yeah. And my mum, so my mum's only child. My dad has, you know, uh, five sons, but, you know, they lived in Nigeria for the most part. So I was raised an only child. And I went to a school that was predominantly white. And 
what happened there is, I guess that there wasn't, and I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, I didn't know I was very different, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I had the sense that, um, you know, I think I think more than other people, but then that was mm -hmm. also followed by, but I'm not in anyone else's head, so I don't really know, yeah. you know? But I was always, you know, drawn to things that were somewhat melancholic or some mm. things that like are just um, very emotive, you know? Um, I was always drawn to that and I've always sort of felt on the, in some ways, outside of a lot of things. So I'm a woman, but like not a woman in the way that other women I see mm -hmm. around me are, you know? And, you know, I, I relate to, or I'm, I'm interested in lots of, let's say, mainstream black culture, as yeah. they call it. Um, but still, like, I don't resonate with everything in the way that other people do. And I was never like, well, you know, what they would describe as like the typical Nigerian girl. And so I'd always felt maybe on the fringes of mm. things for mm -hmm. a lot of time. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I'd become more conscious of that as I grew up and meeting other people. Um, and they kind of let me know this. Uh, I think one of the things that really, you know, set me free, I often say is, I spent a long time, I remember being in all these popular circles, going out and having a really great time with people. And I'd come home and nothing, nothing bad had happened. You no, know, everyone was, you know, perfectly pleasant with me. And I'd come home and feel this powerful, palpable um, sense of just like sorrow and sadness. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd often end up crying and not knowing why. Um, but I'd recognize in those times, it was because whenever I was with my friends, I recognized that we were able to engage with things I just didn't understand. Mm. I didn't, yeah, I just didn't get it. And that would often make me feel broken. Um, and I remember going through, you know, a really deep psychological shift at a certain point. And it just occurred to me, oh, like, you feel that way because you don't like those things. <laughs> you know, it mm. never occurred to me that I was, a, you know, that I was allowed to not like things. Yes. You know, yes. and when, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So great. And when I you know became okay with that and i just realized it was as simple as that i don't know it really it really changed my life in many ways um and you know equally like as much as you know i i feel sometimes you know quite alienated from a lot of things i try not to lean into it because at the same time i do know underneath a lot of the things that we tell ourselves and the ways that we feel like we have to be um, I think we all do feel quite similar. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I think if you ask most people, do you fit in? Even those who really seem like they do. Right. No <laughs> one truly does. Right. You know, underneath it all, you know, a lot of what we're doing is, is a performance, is a dance mm. that we think we have to do. Um, and I think that's why, or I can see it in the people that resonate with me sometimes that are really quite different. Um, and that's the beauty of reading that you get a lot of the time is that, you you connect to these people that have been long dead you know because i think yeah underneath it all I, I guess i've always come from the standpoint that i do still think we have a lot more in common than we do apart Absolutely. you know i think i did say that in, in that wokeness video that was mm -hmm. like in 2018 mm -hmm. and you know not much has shown me that's untrue um and so i don't know i think you know i'm also a person who who thinks about death a lot um <laughs> and because of that you know, that leads you to kind of thinking about the life that you want to live. Um, and yeah, I think, I think because I'm thinking often about the life that I want to live and I'm very conscious of the fact that, you know, this is not, this is not permanent. I think it makes me feel less fearful of the parts of me um, the, that don't quite fit because I think I understand that everyone has it, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not as afraid of it as I, as I once was. Yeah. Mm. That is so Oof. deep and moving. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a recurring theme also through this conversation, identifying our, our darkness, our mm -hmm. flaws, our humanity mm. really is what it is, is the word I like to use for, sure. for all the messy parts is in some ways, just the fact that we're human. And I think, I see a lot of intolerance for humanity mm -hmm. in our culture. Um, there's this this kind of like it's it's funny. It's you know it might come from like the most progressive people, but it mm -hmm. has this very puritanical old ethos behind it, which is you should be good, you must be good, you must be perfect. Perfection, right? right, right. I think in some ways our entire culture is suffering from perfectionism yeah. and this inability to tolerate our humanity. And I think that individually, 
our inability to tolerate and to accept our own humanity, our own flaws, our own messy parts, our own sense of not belonging, then ends up having us do the same to everyone else. Mm. Where we're harsh to other people, we expect them to be perfect, we expect them to not be offensive, to not be wrong, you know. And it's such a self-sabotaging, which is something you've spoken about, mm. um, it's such a self-sabotaging dynamic because it's impossible we're not going to be perfect other people are not going to be perfect and we set up this dynamic where we cannot give we can't tolerate the fact that we're not the same in some regards and that's probably the thing that we're most the same on in some ways is that we're going to have our individual journeys and our flaws and all of that um and you know this constant surprise that oh my gosh this person said this thing this person did this thing this person is wrong oh my gosh like wow i'm shocked that someone was wrong or offensive that's never happened before and i I just wonder about that that pattern of of setting ourselves up for constant disappointment in other people Mm. you know and then in some way it's something we we afflict on ourselves which is i can't have space for people to just be and that's something I think you guys are really good at. And mm-hmm. I think it's maybe one of those things that we share in common um, that we're interested in things as they are. Yes. You know, not as we'd like them to be, mm-hmm. but as they are in reality. And when you are interested in finding what things truly are, um, you have to give them the space to be. Yeah. You know, you have to withhold judgment a lot of the time because you don't know what it is yet. You don't know if it's good or it's bad. You don't know it. And so you leave that space to find that out. Um, and that that space, leaving that space of non-judgment for people and ideas and all of that, um, it's so healing. Mm-hmm. It's so powerful. It's so rare. Um, and and I think that it it is what we want. You know, you said something that um, you're seeking connection, you're seeking something new. You know, we're talking about yeah. this, how how we want newness, we want life, we want growth, we want progress, real progress, you know, not just stale conversations where we scold whoever it is today. Um, and I think the way that we get that is to allow for non-judgment in a way, to kind of be with what is. I don't know why I'm getting so... Uh, metaphysical and no, zeny yes. right now like <laughs> give me with what is yeah. but really though and and you guys really embody that to me um and i think it's so cool mm-hmm. i i just want to see it more and I, I in some ways i'm very sad about social media because i think it set us back um i think it put a lot of us at, it just as a culture it threw all of our messiness into our faces and we were not prepared for how messy shit Mm. really is Mm -hmm. and having to see it constantly having to be confronted with messy people that you don't even like you don't look like you're not similar to them in any way um you don't have that ease of well it's my neighbor well it's my friend you know where we have this connection to people in our circle that makes us a little more charitable charitable for them um you know some stranger on the internet uses uh they have the wrong idea You have no impetus to be a little bit more uh, graceful with them. Yeah. And so it creates this really hostile environment. Um, And I think it trains us to then just go into the world with that. Right. Absolutely. I've seen people that way where um, whatever is happening in the world, they apply this kind of harsh, rigid lens to it. And it robs them of what could be, you know, what might actually be there. And and generally just a more healthy perspective. Mm. Yeah. I guess maybe we should wrap up with some final words. I don't know if anybody has any final words. I usually hate when people do this to me on a podcast. Do you have any final words? I was like, I just spoke for an hour. What are you talking about? You want final words? Um, Okay, okay. Here's here's, 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 here. Let me me pull pull out one of my little questions. Okay. If you could um, encapsulate your worldview Mm -hmm. in a sentence, what would it be? I know that's so in some ways very difficult, but like if you could just put your perspective, what's your guiding principle? If you could put it into a sentence, what would it be? I mean, I will live to regret this probably (laughs) because um, (laughs) it probably isn't quite right. But how I feel like right now is probably that... um, 
we're all more powerful than we know, but we're also much darker than we know. Mm. And I think that's my my guiding sentiment with everything. I love that. I hope you don't regret it because I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Mine is something that I actually wrote in my journal, well, on a little post-it, because I I journal on little post-its yesterday. Um, And it said, you have your story, they have theirs, and another one lies undiscovered between you. That's that's mine. Mm, Yeah. That's good. That's, if I can keep that in mind every time I write or speak, that feels that feels true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm. I love that. Um, mm. Yours? Yours? I was <laughs> I was gonna try to just end it. <laughs> no, I was no, no, gonna no, no, say, no, no, no. "All right, that's all, folks." Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man. I think for me personally my guiding principle mm. i know oh my gosh it's it's cliche i'm sorry no, i'm gonna come up with me. something more profound mm-mm, mm-mm. it's honestly just how can i love this how can i love this how can i find a way to love this mm-hmm. because there's so many things where it's just like mm. i'm in the mundane it's oh i gotta do this work i gotta do this thing oh this person's annoying oh why are they wrong about this they could just not be wrong (laughs) all Mm. these like little things that build up um and rob us of being able to love the moment yes you know you could love you could choose to just love a thing and that's so cool to me i could choose to love this thing right now but i'm not gonna do that Mm. why would you do that to yourself Mm -hmm. You know, you can love all these mundane things instead of making it, I've got to be good. I hope this is good. Um, I'd rather not do this right now. I'd rather be doing something else. All these things that are really um, unpleasant experiences. Right. They're such common ways of thinking. You know, we're always in the future in some regard or in the past or all of this. Um, and I find that when I try to love whatever is, it's funny to me because mm. a lot of the time it'll be like my mom being annoying. I'm like, how can I love this? I and love I'm like, that. yes, no, but I can because yeah. it's funny. It's absurd. Yes. You know, life is so weird. And if you try to love it, it reveals that weirdness because to me, it reminds me love is not something you reserve for perfection. Mm. Love is not something you're waiting to find this magical, wonderful thing that deserves love. Love is something you give yourself by giving it to others, by giving it to what is. So if I am able to walk through the world constantly finding things and people to love, I have love all the time. And it's just like, what else do you want? That's beautiful. So yeah, that's that's mine. I, I don't know why I'm way. turning such no, a sap at the that. end of this one. <laughs> yes. I love that we're ending on love because I feel like right. our culture is so averse to speaking about mm. love outside of the romantic context. Yes. You know, and I think um, we suffer for that. Yeah. So, yeah. I totally agree. Mm. And 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 you know what? I'll have the courage to be cringe. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, that is a perfect place to kind there of know, you go. have the courage. Yeah, have, I, the, courage have the courage to be cringe. cringe because we all are. Truly. Right. Do you know we what are. I mean? We actually all are. Exactly. Deep down, like you know, not even um, deep yeah, down. Yeah, deep down. You know, I was saying this on Twitter the other day. Like, even our addiction to Twitter is evidence oh of the cringe so in us. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, why pretend? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's so, so true. Yeah. That's the thing. You're either cringe or you're hiding the fact that right. you're cringe. And it's like, who's more free? Exactly. Free to be cringe. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you both thank so you. much. Oh, thank no. You. Thank you. You guys, I put the, I was like, hey, um, in a week, can we all get together in a studio in a random yes. place in London and talk for 30, uh, an hour and 30 minutes? Yeah. And you guys just showed up. No, and I think it's absolutely the fact that I think we all feel so strongly about each other, yes. despite yes. the fact that we don't know each other very well, yes. because 
there is, as we said, you know, there's a, there's a lonely aspect mm. to mm. this, you know, and, you know, it puts you in your head a lot more and, you know, being able to speak with mm. you know, people that you admire and that make you feel sane. Yes. <laughs> you oh my know? gosh, yes. It's, it's, it's such a wonderful thing. And like I said, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm not that keen on doing a lot of podcasts if I don't have a connection me to a right person or if they don't want to have a connection with me. Yeah, you right. know, like because yes. um, I'm open to that with everyone, but I can't just be a dog in your fight. I don't mm. need fame that yeah. bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not or a platform or anything like no. that. Um, no, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. So no, thank you, honestly. It's an oh honor. no, I'm mm. so glad that honor. we did this and. Do follow us or don't yes. don't because we don't need it yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> no no i mean really the thing is i would recommend people to follow you guys yeah, because yeah, it's same. such a great Thank you. Mm, Me too. um you have such great energies and oh god i'm just really devolving into the zen at the end of this podcast <laughs> but listen I, like to. energy to. transfers even through a screen yes and to speak to um your earlier point what we were talking about about how you feel you know mm. like we seem like thinkers and yeah we're thinking and that's yes. great and i love to think but don't forget to feel mm. and you know it's when you're both. scrolling when you're going it's through both. the world when you're hanging out with people how do you feel you know, and that it's in, it can be very simple in that regard. Yeah. Um, and that's a really great compass. And every time I read something from you guys or I'm around you, if I have that wonderful pleasure, mm -hmm. it feels so good and transcendent. Yes. And I'm so lucky. I feel so lucky and grateful for that. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll end it there. <laughs>